Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast with your host, Andrew Keel. This is the podcast where you can get the education you need to invest 100% passively in the highly profitable niche of mobile home parks. Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. This is your host, Andrew Keel. And today we have an amazing guest in CPA, Noah Rosenfarb. Noah is a third generation CPA and has been studying the tax code his entire life to find legal loopholes to reduce or eliminate paying taxes. Noah is not just your typical CPA either because he has over 20 years of real estate investing experience and through 31 acquisitions, he's built a massive portfolio of 3,500 apartment units and over a half a million square feet of office buildings and retail shopping centers. Wow. He is the chief investment officer at Freedom Family Office. He personally serves as the primary financial advisor for entrepreneurs that want to convert their net worth to predictable passive income so they can live the life they want. Noah, awesome to have you, dude. Thank you so much for being with us today. With pleasure. I I'm, I'm, uh, appreciate the invitation. So I would love to start out by doing just a, a quick deal review, you know, to walk through like a sample deal, a uh, sample mobile home park deal where the purchase price is a million dollars, just to make our mm-hmm. math easy. And sure. I would like to discuss with you the depreciation basis and but bonus depreciation in year one to make sure, you know, my audience and I understand the tax benefits fully that real estate and mobile home parks specifically provide. So let's start out and assume the, the, the following for a typical $1 million mobile home park. You know, the, the land, let's put that at, at 30% of the purchase price uh, is the land and that'll be not depreciated. Uh, 35% of the purchase price we'll say is the infrastructure. And Martin, tell me if I'm wrong on any of these, but that's usually depreciable over 15 years on a straight line basis. And then we'll allocate the remaining 35% to goodwill, which is depreciable over 15 years, again, on a straight line basis. So altogether uh, with the infrastructure and the goodwill, that, that puts us at 70% of the asset's value that could possibly be depreciable over 15 years at an equal annual amount, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this could equal like on a like on a, a one million dollar property, this could equal around forty six thousand dollars per year, and you know on the NOI on something like that would be you know say at a nine cap would be ninety grand a year, you know so that means you would potentially only be paying taxes on around forty four thousand dollars, which is the ninety minus the forty six. Just to yeah, just that's to make- if, and that's if you paid cash, right? That's if you don't have exactly. any interest that you're paying as well. Exactly. And it would go up if you, if you had uh, debt, right? If you had some Correct. financing on it. Man, yeah. And right. that's one of the amazing things about investing in real estate is depreciation doesn't affect the investor when it comes to the returns they're going to measure. The money that comes into their account, either on a monthly or a quarterly basis, or the money that comes into their account when they refinance, all of that cash is really unaffected by depreciation. And so depreciation is really just this tax concept that says at some point in time, we're going to need to replace these assets that we're depreciating. So the government gives us a deduction for that. But the reality is that almost inevitably, if you own real estate for 10 or 20 or 30 years, it's worth more than when you bought it, not worth less. So it's just this great gift that the IRS has given us. That's a great way to put it. It's a, it's a gift for sure. And then if we, if we touch on bonus depreciation, which is just another added benefit here, the depreciation on the infrastructure, which is typically about 35% of the, the purchase price, that can be accelerated from 15 years to one year under the new tax law right now. So yeah, with, with some limits, but you know, certainly on a million dollar park, you're going to get that all in year one. And so you'll, you'll pocket that 350 grand in depreciation. If you've got some debt on the property, you might get a write-off of more than you invested in the property itself. 
So, you know, again, that's a pretty amazing opportunity if you know what to do with it. And maybe we'll cover a little bit about who gets that benefit and who doesn't. Yeah. And maybe you could, you could elaborate on that, you know, just to kind of tell the listeners, you know, when they want, you know, what a taxable loss, how they can carry that over to cover other income that they may have. Yeah. So anyone that's investing in real estate, you're either going to be one of two types of investors, either you're a passive limited partner, and maybe you're not a real estate professional. You're just investing in these deals because they're good investments. And for you, the rules are slightly different than for people like Andrew and I that are real estate professionals. The government says, if you're a professional, you could take that deduction and offset it against any other income you have. So you mentioned I have a family office business. I have a real estate business. I have a few other businesses. No matter what income I receive from those companies, if my real estate throws off losses, I can offset them against my other active income. That's a really great benefit of being a real estate professional. Now, if you're not a real estate professional, the government recognizes that you still should get a benefit as well. So you could offset any real estate income that you've had. So let's say you bought a mobile home park four years ago, and now you're selling it and you're facing a capital gains tax, which is not a bad problem to have. And you don't want to do a 1031 exchange, which maybe we could touch on. So you've got this taxable gain, but now you just invested in this new park that was a million dollars, yet you put in 250 grand, the rest was financed, and you get a $350,000 write-off. That's going to offset 350,000 of the capital gain from the property that you just came out of. Now, if you don't have real estate gains to offset your real estate losses, you can deduct up to $25,000 of those losses against ordinary income. And the remainder is just going to carry over into a future year. So not too terrible, but a lot of times with the people that I counsel, if you've got one spouse who's actively at work, engaged in a business, and maybe another spouse, their primary role is really being a caretaker at home, what we're looking at is to figure out, is there a way we could make them a real estate professional? Because if we get to make them a real estate professional, and you're investing in you know, two, three, four deals a year, and you're planning on doing that for the next decade, two decades, three decades, well, if your spouse could become a real estate professional and manage this portfolio that you're building, now you could start to take all those losses and offset your ordinary income. So that's one of the planning strategies that we look to implement if we can. I love that. That's, that's super cool. Since you mentioned it, would love to mention the 1031 exchange uh, and a, or a, a 721 exchange. You know, maybe you could just kind of elaborate a little bit on those. I, I would assume most of our listeners understand what those are and have heard those terms before, but maybe you could just kind of tell us. Sure. And I'm a bit of, uh, I guess, unique in that I don't really love 1031 exchanges. So 1031 exchanges are designed to take your profits from one property that you're selling and you roll it all into a new property. But what I've found over time, especially because I have uh, LP investors in my deals as well, and uh, you know, I'll give you a great example. We bought a building in Texas a couple years ago. Everything's performed really well. We're ready to sell it at the end of the summer. Uh, we'll get about four and a half times our money. So somebody that invested 250 grand with me back you know, a few years ago when we acquired the building, they're looking at getting back a little bit more than a million dollars right now. If we did a 1031 exchange, that means they're going to have a million dollars tied up into one property. And, you know, my clients are wealthy and, and they certainly could afford to have that. But my preference is for them to diversify their risk, take that money and maybe split it up into three $350,000 investments that we'll make over the next 12 months rather than lump it all together into one single property. Uh, I think 1031s are really great for active investors. So people that are putting their own skin in the game, they're building their portfolio, they're trading up in value, they work really well for those people that have direct control and they're really putting all their eggs in one basket because that's the way you build significant wealth in a short amount of time. But for LP investors who are really looking at real estate as a way to diversify their risk, create passive income, have steady stable returns, what I've found over time is that if you could diversify out of one property that's done really well, plant four more seeds, maybe in you know a couple different markets, a couple different asset classes, 
then we use that bonus depreciation, cost segregation, and we get those losses in the first year that you're investing in those other properties. And it could offset most of the gains that you had on the last one. I love that. That's a that's high level advice right there. So thank you for sharing that. You mentioned uh, cost segregation in a cost segregation study. Would you mind just kind of elaborating on that? We typically sure. do those uh, on the on the acquisitions that we purchase. Can you explain what that is to to those that don't know what it is? Yeah. So again, we're talking a lot about depreciation, which is kind of this fake idea, right? That that we're buying something and we're going to reduce the amount that it's worth every year. Now, some things like Andrew mentioned, you're going to deduct them one fifteenth per year. And after 15 years, it's worthless. Uh, but the government has different rules for what you're allowed to deduct and when. So some properties or some pieces of a property, like maybe carpet. So if you have carpet or you have paneling inside of a room, maybe that's only five-year property and you're going to deduct that over five years. Maybe your kitchen cabinets, you could deduct over 10 years. And so when we buy a building, we send in an engineering expert and they go in and they assess from the purchase price how to allocate it to five-year property, seven-year property, and 10-year property so that we're not lumping everything into this 15-year bucket or 27 and a half-year bucket. And we start to accelerate our depreciation through this cost segregation study. So it's an engineering study to divide up the purchase price into smaller parts. So instead of just land and building, we've got land, We've got the exterior of the building, and then we are breaking out the interior of the buildings into smaller component parts so we could depreciate it faster. Awesome. Yeah. Like the carpet, the hot water heaters, the you know doors, paneling, everything is separated out. That's fantastic. Yeah. Uh, to jump into a couple questions, you know, let's assume that a listener uh, of this podcast has never passively invested in a real estate syndication before. You know, what should they expect come tax time on their first syndication? Well, the first thing you should expect is not to file on time. So, you know, <laughs> if if you're one of those people that you know you've got to get your return in by April fifteenth, you should think carefully about who you're investing in syndications with and make sure that they are able to produce that tax return timely. Unfortunately, the way this business goes for a lot of syndicators, they don't get their K-1s out by the initial filing deadline and they go on extension. And for some investors, that's really frustrating. Uh, you know, My perspective as a, a CPA and someone that's advising clients and making these investments, it doesn't really matter. You could go on extension. There's no real big deal about going on extension. But if that's going to get the hair on the back of your neck up, if you're going to be upset about it, make sure to confirm that you're going to get your tax return K-1 information on time to give it to your preparer so you could file your return timely. Uh, the second thing to consider is the K-1 that you receive as a passive investor might also have a K-1 for the individual state in which the property or properties are located. And if you're in Florida where I live, there's no state income tax. But if I own property in an, a state where there is an income tax, I may be required to file a state income tax return in that state for the income I received on that property. Now, Again, that's not really a big deal. There's some compliance costs around it. But if your accountant charges you an extra $300 to prepare your Georgia return and your investment that you made is only producing you know, $1,100 or $1,300 a year of income, well, that's a pretty significant portion of the income to give up to the accountant to pay your filing fees. So just make sure that you're appropriately sizing your investment to take on this additional cost burden of the accounting compliance. I love that. Yep. That's a, that's a great tip. What should passive investors ask their CPA before investing in a, you know, a real estate syndication, you know, passively? Uh, I think most people don't always go to their CPA for advice before they do something. They're typically going to their CPA after it's already done. <laughs> and unfortunately, the professions encourage that in a way by 
the style of CPAs charging fees. So you're either paying a fixed fee for your tax return to be prepared after the year end. And if you want anything else, you're going to have to pay hourly to your accountant. And most people aren't that anxious to pay their accountant any more money. And most accountants really aren't looking to charge that hourly rate to clients because it tends to be inefficient. When you go to the person who's your tax preparer, usually they're the ones at the highest level, you know, the, the partners in a firm or a sole mm-hmm. practitioner preparer. And they their time is the most valuable asset they have. The way that accountants make money is during tax season, they have people that are underneath them at lower hourly rates doing some of your work so that they're able to generate more than their hourly rate on the time that they're spending on your return. When you go to them asking for advice, it's not as profitable because they're the only ones that sure. could give you that advice. Uh, so I would say certainly ask your accountant, see if they could be helpful in structuring your investment. You may find that if you're investing in multiple deals in multiple states, if you don't necessarily have an asset protection strategy, you're going to want to look at that. Maybe it's not the best idea to invest in your personal name. You want to decide with that accountant if you should be setting up any entities between you and that individual real estate investment. Perfect. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. And then, you know, just to, to go back, I just remembered this. You know, if, if our investors are investing in a, a REIT, uh, or another option like an investment fund, you know, does that depreciation that we talked about previously, will that still carry over and provide the same benefits to the limited partners? So in funds, they're typically passing through all the depreciation. On the REITs, if you're getting a K-1, you'll receive a portion of the depreciation. If you're not getting a K-1 through that REIT because it's structured as a C corporation, then the C corporation itself is getting the benefit and you're only receiving a dividend, which is tax at dividend tax rates, which is already net of the depreciation. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thank you for touching on that. If, if some of our passive investors are investing through their IRAs or other retirement accounts, you know, what do they need to know about UBIT and UBIT taxes on assets they invest in that are, you know, taking on financing leverage? Could you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, this is an area where there's lots of confusion, both by the investors and by the syndicators, because most people are under the impression that if I have my money in an IRA, and I invest in a real estate project, and let's say I invest 100000 and five years later, I get back 200000 on a sale. Well, it's in an IRA. I don't have to pay any tax. Unfortunately, you might be wrong. So if you own real estate in an IRA, there's this portion of the tax code, which Andrew mentioned, called UBIT, which says if if, or UDFI is another acronym that is attributed to this. But basically, inside your IRA, not everything is tax-free. There's a couple of exemptions. And one of the things that is not tax-free is real estate in which there's debt on the real estate. So if there's a mortgage when you acquire the property, or if you add a mortgage or a line of credit after you acquire the property, now all of a sudden, there's a formula that has to apply to determine how much of your gains or your income becomes taxable, even though it's held by an IRA. Now, the thing most people don't know is that if you own your real estate in a 401k, then that doesn't apply. Now, why? Who knows? But if you own your real estate in a 401k plan, it doesn't apply. The challenge is that most people who have control over their retirement accounts tend to have control through an IRA, not a 401k. The 401k is held with their employer. But if you're self-employed or you're over the age of your employer's requirement for what's called an in-service distribution, you are kind of stuck with your employer plan. If you're self-employed, you could set up your own self-directed 401k. So I have my own self-directed 401k. It acts much like my self-directed IRAs, which I also have. Uh, But inside my self-directed 401k, I can make those real estate investments and not be subject to UDFI on my real estate deals. Wow. I love that. That's, That's another golden nugget right there. I love it. So I know you own companies in Puerto Rico, and we have talked briefly about this. I know they have some tax incentives. 
Can you share a little bit about that with the audience? And Yeah, sure. And- I'll, I'll kind of give you the, the short story. And if anyone's really curious, they could just contact me directly and I could share some more specifics. But I own a corporation, a C corporation that I formed in Puerto Rico. Uh, and the reason I formed a corporation in Puerto Rico is Puerto Rico invited me. They said, Noah, please come here, do business on our island. And they, they made this offer to everyone in the United States. Please come bring your business here. And the way we're going to attract you is we'll offer you a 4% corporate tax rate guaranteed for 20 years. So if you're producing value on the island and that value is getting exported off of the island. So in my case, we provide consulting services in Puerto Rico to US-based companies and individuals. All of the income we generate would be taxed at 4%. And then one of the unique things I did is when I set up that C corporation, I actually set up a 401k plan inside the C corporation. And I rolled over some money from one of my existing 401ks into my new company 401k. And then I bought the stock of that company in my 401k plan. So so I started the company, C Corporation, it has shares. My 401k plan had some money in it. The 401k plan bought those shares from the company. And now my company's owned by my 401k plan. And then I took one extra step and I said, you know what? The government on our 401k plan allows us to put money in and not pay taxes now. But when we take it out, we have to pay taxes. And they also have another plan, which is called a Roth plan after Senator Roth, where we could pay the tax now and then never pay tax again. So I decided, let me convert this 401k, which owns my Puerto Rico C-Corp, into a Roth 401k plan. And so now by paying tax on the shares that I bought, which were at a low basis because I did it when the company was formed, I now own all of my stock in that company inside of a Roth 401k plan. So let's say, for example, this year, we've got a million dollars in profit. I pay $40,000 of income tax to Puerto Rico. They're very excited because they weren't going to have that $40,000 had I not chosen to set up shop down there in Puerto Rico. I've got $960,000 of profit. I issue a dividend to my 401k plan, which is the owner. Dividends aren't taxable inside of a 401k plan, just like if Microsoft or GE or Coca-Cola or Procter & Gamble issues a dividend inside your 401k plan, there's no taxes. So that $960,000 goes into my 401k plan tax-free. I can invest it in real estate. I can invest it in stocks. I can invest it in private businesses. And any income that I make inside that 401k is tax-free for my lifetime. If I end up taking that money out after I turn 59 and a half, I'll pay no income tax on it, no matter what state I live in. And wow. I'll be able to pull that money out tax-free for the rest of my life. Wow. That, that, that was a lot of CPA jargon right there. <laughs> if, if I was going to do anything like that, I, I think I would contact you and, and talk more. But uh, that's why you work with not the 1%, you work with the half percent. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we tend to work with entrepreneurs that have built a significant net worth and now they're looking at how do they convert that into their passive income so that every month, you know, whether it's 50,000, a hundred thousand, 200,000 a month, they're just like clockwork receiving it in their bank account. And we're taking care of everything else on the back end. They get to live the life that they dream of. We help them make sure that they build family bonds, protect their legacy, protect their assets. That's our core business. I love that. I love that. And could you share a little bit about the the 506C that you just started? And, and Yeah, well, man, this is really exciting. So if you look over my shoulder, you see two logos. One is Freedom. Uh, Freedom Family Office is our primary business. And then we also started Freedom Internet Group, Inc., which is called Fiji. And if you go to FijiRoyalty.com, you'll learn about a very unique business that I set up with a partner. Uh, we've got 20 years of experience buying internet businesses. So as someone that's always looked for yield, I like cash flow. I really love buying cash flow. I don't like investing in the future. I like buying the present. And so uh, over time, I started investing in internet businesses. And what was so unique to me as someone that owns real estate is when I buy real estate, uh, I'm usually buying something, let's just use a five cap as an example. I'm paying 20 times earnings. Well, in these small internet businesses that we acquire, 
we're paying three times earnings. <laughs> so, you know, it's like a 33 cap that we're buying these businesses at. <laughs> uh, so I started buying websites with a partner, East Chapman, back in 2014. We started a private equity fund. We went out and acquired a pool of assets. And what we came to realize is that there was this really unique opportunity in this small market of lifestyle entrepreneur led internet businesses where people are making anywhere from 150,000 to about a million and a half dollars a year running their own online business. They're, when they go and transact and they buy and sell companies between each other, the SBA is not interested. There's no Fannie or Freddie. So most of those transactions are financed with a component of seller financing and the balance being cash at closing from the acquirer. And what we've decided and, and what we've created is an opportunity to put in equity, in, in, instead of equity, really, a slug of cash where we're helping finance a transaction, but in exchange, we're receiving a percentage of revenue for that business. So uh, take that example of you know, somebody's buying a million dollar business, that business might produce 400,000 of cash flow for the owner. Uh, well, when somebody goes to buy it, usually the seller's putting about a half a million dollars in seller financing, and the buyer's got to come up with half a million. Well, now we can come in, maybe put in 150, 200, 250 grand, and in exchange receive a percentage of revenue. And typically at closing, we're generating anywhere from 25 to 35% returns on our capital if the business stays exactly the same. And then as that business grows, obviously, we would get higher returns. If the business detracted, we'd get lower returns. And so this business, Fiji Royalty, where we're acquiring internet royalties and internet-based businesses, we're on a path to take that company public. We're an SEC reporting company already, and we're raising a pre-IPO round right now, which we're doing as my first 506C. I've never done that before. So I'm excited I'm able to share that with people like you and your listeners if they have any interest or want to learn more about it. It's just really unique. It's a real unique niche. Uh, you know, people think mobile home park investing may be a step off the beaten path. This is like, uh, you know, going down two or three more paths from there. <laughs> you could visit FijiRoyalty.com. You'll see an investor page where I've got a video you could watch that describes our business model and our origin story. I love it. Thank you for sharing that. It's super niche, and I love it. Just just like mobile home parks, it, it's you know it's different. It has that stigma, but it's uh, it's quote unquote alternative investment options. So, it, you know, I started in in twenty twelve. I started an alternative lending fund, and so we've been investing in private debt for actually it's about nine years now. And the same thing was true then. You know, we were investing in private debt typically to generate anywhere from a six to 8% return net of fees and expenses, you know, nothing big, no home runs, just short-term high quality credit. And the deals that we've done have been really interesting. And, you know, I'm always looking for where's the next place that I could generate a yield where I think my risk adjusted return is better than everything else I'm seeing in the market. And, uh, and so Fiji is one of those opportunities that's come to me through my, you know, wild search through all the asset classes to figure out where's the best place to invest my capital. I love that. You're such an entrepreneur, you know, you see most CPAs and not every CPA, you know, thinks real estate related, let alone, you know, entrepreneurial like. So that's one thing I, I love about you. And, you know, I really appreciate all the value you've added today. Uh, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Yeah, it's with pleasure, man. Awesome. So if our listeners want to get a hold of you, what's the best way for them to do so, Noah? Uh, so LinkedIn's always a good place to reach out. My name again, Noah Rosenfarb. If you're interested in real estate syndication, you could go to our syndication platform, which is investwithourfamily.com. If you're a real successful entrepreneur and you're trying to think through how to reduce your taxes and build your passive income stream and build that lifestyle that you really deserve, you could do it, check out freedomfamilyoffice.com. And of course, if you want to learn about the power of royalties, you could visit fijiroyalty.com, F-I-G-I royalty.com. Awesome, Noah. Thanks again for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Enjoy. Thanks so the much rest for having your, me. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of your day. That's it for, uh, for today's uh, show, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in. Hey, are you getting value out of this show? If so, 
would you mind please going over to iTunes and leaving the show a quick five-star review? I have a goal of hitting over 100 five-star reviews by the end of 2021, and it would mean the absolute world to me if you could help contribute to that. Thanks ahead of time for making my day with your five-star review of the show.